Hello students. Welcome to this week's lecture on taxing and budgeting. We're going to sit here and discuss how the state gets their money, where, where they get their money to pay for their budget. Most of the money comes from taxes and we see that taxes are done at different levels of government. Our first is going to be the federal government, these national taxes. How does the federal government collect the majority of their tax money? This is through the 16th Amendment. The 16th Amendment is the one that created the income tax. The 16th Amendment simply says, the Congress shall have power to lay and collect taxes on incomes from whatever source derived without apportionment among the several states and without regard to any census or enumeration. Basically what this means is that the 16th Amendment allowed individual and corporate income taxes to immediately become the nation, the, excuse me, the national government's major source of funding. Today, this national income tax uh, uh, constitutes approximately 60% of the federal tax revenue. So the government gets approximately 60% of its money from the federal income tax. State taxes. Texas used to rely on property tax for its main source of income. However, relying on property tax can have issues. There, there can be problems. And simply, what happens when property values decline? If your property value declines, your tax base declines. You're not going to get as much money in as you had anticipated. We saw this happen in the 1930s. Now, property value declined during the Great Depression, so the state had to look for other ways to create income. So starting in the 1930s, we see that Texas starts to tax cigarettes, beer, distilled spirits. Finally, in 1961, Texas adopted a general sales tax on most items. So here, we're looking at things, not only, this isn't only sales tax, but it's, it's different items or different things that Texas charges a tax on. 911 emergency service fee, 911 equalization, equalization surcharge, 911 prepaid wireless emergency service fee, automotive cell oil, oil sales fee, natural gas, oil and gas, petroleum, property tax, sales and use tax, school bond benefit, sexually oriented business fee, insurance taxes, assessments and fees, inheritance, gasoline, franchise, fireworks. So yes, these are the things that the state taxes. So it's not only sales tax, and I'm gonna go into a little bit greater detail about some of these items. But we have our sales tax. This is gonna, a sales tax is gonna be, or a general sales tax, is a broad-based tax collected on the retail price of most items. Exemptions in Texas are going to include food items. Now, I don't mean fast foods or prepackaged snack foods. We're talking bread, milk, water, meat. We're not talking candy bars, chips. Those are the, considered the prepackaged things. Or going to McDonald's, buying your dinner there, that's prepackaged. Buying meat that you have to take home and cook is okay. Medicine is not subject to a sales tax. Baby supplies, however, what's the one thing you really need if you have a baby? You need diapers. They, the state of Texas does tax diapers, but they don't tax other baby supplies. Newspapers, and one week in a year, Texas will not tax school supplies. 
Our next thing is called a selective sales tax or an excise tax. <coughs> These are taxes that are levied on the sale, manufacture, or use of particular items. Might be liquor, cigarettes, gasoline. However, these taxes are usually included in the item's purchase price, so it's often thought of a, as a hidden tax. And what I mean by that is, if you go purchase a gallon of gasoline and you pay whatever the going rate is, X number of dollars gets you a gallon of gasoline. Well, you're not actually paying X number of dollars because this price well, you're paying X number of dollars, but it's not for gasoline. The, the full amount does not go for gasoline. This price includes taxes. So it might be you're paying a federal tax, a sales tax. For example, if the, if the price of gasoline is $2.50 a gallon, once again, I'm just pulling a number, you know, you might actually be paying $2, but this excise tax is 50 cents. So it's hidden tax. We don't know we are paying it. We assume it is part of the price of the product, part of the price of the gasoline, part of the price of the cigarettes, part of the price of the liquor. Texas also has something called gross receipts taxes. And these are simply taxes on the total gross revenue or sales of certain enterprises, certain businesses. Finally, the state has something called a severance tax. A severance tax is a tax on raw materials, like oil or natural gas, when they are extracted from their natural state. So whenever they are, they are extracted from the ground, the company that is pumping and the, the company that is harvesting these resources has to pay a tax when they come out of the ground. Finally, okay, the national taxes is the federal government, state taxes is, is the state government. We see that there's a third level of government that can tax. And this is the local government, these are local taxes. <coughs> well, what's left? National taxes does income. Remember, Texas does not have a state income tax. State used to do property tax as their main source, and they still do a little bit, but now it's a sales tax. Well, this means that the local taxes, the localities, have to get what's left. So they, we find that the localities are stuck using property tax as their main source of funding. These property taxes that these localities use, the local governments use, are something called ad, A-D, valorem, V-A-L-O-R-E-M. V-A-L-O-R-E-M, ad valorem taxes. And this simply means that an ad valorem tax is a tax assessed according to the value of an item. So we find these ad valorem taxes on real property and personal property. Real property would be considered land, buildings, Personal property would be considered such items that go in the buildings. It could be furniture. It could be the vehicle. Some tax, some counties in Texas actually tax you for your personal item. They tax you on your vehicle. So these would be ad valorem taxes. They, you know, you get your tax bill. They will go out. They will appraise your property value. They will compare it to everything in the neighborhood, what's it selling for, and your taxes are based on your appraised value. These are ad valorem taxes. To come up with an estimated worth, each county in Texas has a central appraisal district which values property according to uniform state standards and procedures. This means that each appraisal district is supposed to be using the same formula. Why is that important? This is done to ensure that each piece of property statewide 
is being valued at every other property. This is to promote consistency. This is to promote conformity. So if we, the, the formula that we use in Harris County, we should be able to take this formula, go to Tarrant County, go to Bear County, go, go somewhere else, any other place in Texas, use the same formula, and we should be able to say how much that building in a different county is appraised for. So you get your, your local tax statement from the local appraisal district and they say, okay, your property is valued at this much. Does this mean you're stuck paying this amount of money? No. When you get your yearly tax appraisal, you can file a protest. This means you go in front of a board at the Central Appraisal District and you explain why you think the property is not worth what the appraisal district states it is worth. If you win, they will lower your, your taxes, they will lower your property value. If you don't win, it remains the same. What are the chances that you win? It depends. If you're in a rural county where they are heavily dependent on tax income, on, on property tax income, you probably won't win. If you are in a metro, metro area, a metro county, <coughs> some that has Houston, Dallas, San Antonio, something that they have a lot of other income besides property tax, you will probably get your property tax reduced. However, there is another route you could take. We have something called exemptions. And exemptions are simply provisions that you can take to decrease the tax liability of, repro of real property. Some of these exemptions can be homeowner's exemptions, agriculture exemptions, if you're over 65, a disabled vet. And what this exemption does is it doesn't get rid of your taxes, but what it does, it, it decreases the value, or the de not the value, it decreases the amount that you're liable for. For example, and I'm just, I'm pulling numbers out and I'm using these numbers to make it easy to do the math. Say your property tax is 10%. It is not 10%. It is hot. That's 10% is high. I am just once again pulling numbers out as an example. Your property tax is 10%. Your appraised value on your home is $100,000. 10% of $100,000 is $10,000. So your property tax bill would be 10% would be $10,000. Once again, this is an example. Well, if you have an exemption, if you're able to take that homeowner's exemption, the over 65 exemption, whichever, whatever exemption you have, it decreases the liability. If you take the homeowner's exemption and the county says the homeowner's exemption is worth $20,000, what this means is that while your house is valued at $100,000, that's, that's your tax value, However, your liability, your tax liability is decreased by that exemption, that $20,000. So while your home is valued at $100,000, you're only taxed on $80,000. This causes you to pay only pay $8,000 a year in property tax versus 10. This is the purpose of exemptions. They can, they can decrease the tax liability of property. But once again, what's the problem with the property tax system? We see the Great Depression, we see values drop. It is not a way to consistently, or that you can, can, you can guess consistently, or you can estimate consistently 
how much money you're going to get in. Now also what we see for local taxes is we see that home cities with home rule, this means cities with a certain population, can also impose a sales tax on all items that the state imposes a sales tax on. So if you go to some of your cities, you may be paying an extra penny, an extra you know, penny in one and a quarter percent sales tax. This goes straight to the city coffers. This goes straight to, to the city government. Then finally, we have special districts. And these can also impose taxes. These are considered local taxes. These special districts would be school districts, mass transit, uh, MUDs, municipal utility districts. These are all local forms of government, for lack of a better word, or local agencies that have the authority to tax us. The politics of taxation. This is really simple. I mean, you have to figure out what to tax. Raising or losing money is simply as easy as raising or lowering a tax rate, the amount per unit of taxable item or activity. So to raise money, to raise tax money, we have to figure out what item or what activity we want to tax. This is going to refer to the tax base. Tax base is simply the object or activity taxed. Now, there's a, there could be a problem based on your tax base, based on your activity. If you, your tax base is a certain object or a certain activity, what's the problem? For example, cigarettes. If your tax base is based on cigarettes, if you have too small of a tax base, if you only have one or two items that are being taxed, or the taxes are high, we see that excessive taxes can change a person or they can even change a business's activities. If you raise tax on cigarettes or alcohol or whatever with the expectation of making more money, what happens if you raise the tax so high that people quit using these objects? They, they quit purchasing these objects or they quit using, using these activities. Well, you lose money because, for once again, cigarettes, if you tax cigarettes and people start to smoke, or stop to smoke because the taxes are so high, you are not going to get in as much money as you anticipated. You are actually hurting yourself. And we even see this on real property. If, if you raise property taxes too high on a certain area, real property if ta taxes are too high on land or they're on homes, taxes are too high on homes, we have to consider, will people be willing to move to this new area? If we tax too high, people can't afford their taxes, so they're going to have to sell their home. But is somebody else when going to pay high taxes? So if we raise too taxes too high, we might accidentally lower the estimated income amount. If we go back to houses, they can't sell the house. So what, what might happen? Well, you're taxing me high on, on my house. I can't sell it. I can't afford it. So what can I do to make my home less valuable? Well, I stop the upkeep on it. I don't take care of it. Not only does that devalue my home, but it also devalues all the homes in the neighborhood. So this actually hurts the locality also, the, the local government because we see while the tax rates are high, the tax values actually come down. 
So to raise revenue, to make sure everybody's going to continue to do it, the tax rate must be low enough that it will not discourage consumers from participating in the activity that you want to tax. So what most governments have found is that they go with something called a broad-based tax. And what this means is that there's a relatively low tax rate on many items or activities. The taxes are spread out more equally, more uniformly through the population. Tax rates are kept low, so this does not discourage people from using these items or using these activities, and the tax rate is paid by a large number of people. It's low enough, we're not bothered paying it, we're still going to use the item, we're still going to purchase the item, we're still going to use the activity, and it is more fair. Everybody is paying what we perceive to be as their fair share. Okay, we, we decided on what to tax, broad-based tax, but there's, there's other things we need to consider. And these are simply whom or why do we tax? And there are three common rationales for taxing various groups. The first rationale is because the government wants to regulate behavior. The second is to tax people according to the benefits they receive. And finally, the third is to tax people according to their ability to pay. So let's look at this first one. We're going to look at regulatory taxes. Regulatory taxes are sometimes called SIN, S-I-N, SIN taxes. A tax is imposed with the intent of exerting social or economic control. They will do this by reducing taxes on approved behaviors or they will impose higher taxes on undesirable activities. Can you think of some examples of this? Sin taxes would be taxes on alcohol, taxes on cigarettes. You know, Texas actually has a sin tax on sexually oriented businesses. And what I mean by this is this is like a cover charge. There is a $5 per head sin tax on everybody who enters into a sexually oriented business. So five, the, the company, or if you, the company doesn't eat it for you, doesn't pay it for you, you have to pay it as part of your cover charge. And this tax goes to a, uh, a fund that supports domestic violence, uh, people who've been abused by domestic violence. These regulatory taxes, these sin taxes, they do not entirely prevent sin, but they do place a substantial share of the tax burden on the center. So while we're not going to stop you from this activity, you are going to pay for it. You are going to pay more. The idea behind this, this regulatory action, say smoking, the idea behind this is we are going to charge a higher tax or we're going to charge smokers a tax because the thought is they are going to eventually get sick. Smoking is going to cause some sort of issue. Because they smoked, they will need to use resources more that Texas provides, health and human services, hospitals, whatnot. They will need to use it more than a non-smoker, so we're going to tax centers, or excuse me, tax smokers, so that they pay their fair share. Why should the healthy people, if you will, pay for your poor choices, for your bad habits? The next one, we called this one the benefits received tax. And this is a tax assessed according to the service received by the, the payers. 
for example, what I'll discuss next time in our, in our next chapter, our next discussion, is Texas has a gas tax. We pay X amount of dollars or X amount of cents to the state of Texas as a gas tax. Is it fair for somebody well, what this what this does, this benefits received tax, this gas tax does, is if you drive, if you have Toyota Corolla, car A, car B, family A, family B, has a Toyota Corolla if they get the exact same gas mileage. Family A drives their vehicle 10,000 miles a year. Family B drives their vehicle 20,000 miles a year. Would it be proper, would it be fair, and I hate using the word fair, but would it be fair for each family to pay the same amount in tax for the upkeep of the road, for Texas highways and roadways? If you say yes, why? If family A is only driving 10,000 miles a year and family B is driving 20,000 miles a year, why should they say, pay the same amount when family B is getting more use? So this is when we get into that benefits received tax. With the gas tax, that is you pay per gallon. Well, who's going to use more gallons of gasoline? The family that drives 10,000 or the family that drives 20,000 miles a year? The family that drives 20,000 miles a year. They're going to purchase more gallons of gas to reach that 20,000 mile plateau. So they are actually paying more in taxes. So they are paying more in taxes because they are receiving a greater benefit of using Texas roadways. They are using it more often than family A. So therefore, under this benefits received taxes, they are paying more. They are paying their share, their usage share, if you will. The last one is the ability to pay tax. And the ability to pay tax are simply taxes that are apportioned according to taxpayers' financial capacity. These types of taxes are going to be property taxes, sales taxes, and income taxes. These ability to pay taxes simply means if you're able to afford more, you pay more. If you're able to afford more valuable property, you should be able to afford to pay a higher tax if you have more money to spend on miscellaneous items. You should have more money to pay in sales taxes. If you have a higher income, you should be able to offset paying more in taxes because you do have a higher income. So these are the ability to pay taxes. Let's talk about tax rates real quick. There's two things here I want to talk about. I want to give two definitions. The first is simply a progressive tax rate. A progressive tax rate is a tax rate that increases as income increases. We see this with the federal income tax. The more money you make, the higher your tax rate will be. I've included a link to a debate on progressive tax rates and if they work or not. The second type of tax rate is called a regressive tax rate. And regressive tax rates seem to be a tax rate that place more of a burden on low and middle income taxpayers than it does on wealthier ones. Example of regressive taxes would be sales tax or most other consumption taxes. 
And let me give you an example of what I'm talking about here. If you look at this slide, you see the numbers on the left. This is going to be your taxable income on the y-axis. On the x-axis, we're talking about our tax rates, what percent of tax we pay. So if we earn between $0 and $8,375, our tax rate is 10%. If we earn between $8,376 and $34,000, our tax rate is 15%. Well, if we earn between $34,000, well, it's $34,001, and $1, up to $82,400, our tax rate is 25%. Once again, 82,401 to 171,850, our tax rate is now 28%. See, this is a progressive tax. As our income goes up, the thought is we were able to afford to pay more in taxes. So we are paying a higher percent as our income goes up. That's progressive. That's easy to see. Now, the other one, this regressive tax rate, this is a little bit harder to grasp. Remember, what we say is that the regressive taxes hit the poor or the middle income earners harder than it does the well-off. So if you look at this chart, this is from 2009, Texas general sales tax paid in dollars and as a percentage of taxable income from 2009. If you go back to 2009 and you paid $10,000, or you, you had $10,000 taxable income. You spent enough money that you paid $259 to Texas in the general sales tax. So you purchased enough items that you paid $259 in sales tax. Well, $259 out of $10,000, you spent 2.59% of your taxable income on taxes. 2.59% isn't bad, it's not high, but that's not the point we're trying to make. Remember we said it hits those that make less money harder. If you make $150,000 a year, your taxable income, I'm sure you will agree $150,000 is more than $10,000. So you had more to spend, so you spent $1,279 in, in general sales tax. You gave Texas $1,279 in sales tax. Once again, this is much, much more than $259. But if we look at this percent of taxable income and who can afford it, if you made $150,000, $150, you actually only paid 0.85% of your taxable income to the state in general sales tax, where for somebody who made one fifteenth of what you made, actually, even though they paid less, they paid a higher percentage in. They paid 2.59% in. So you made much more money and you paid much more in sales tax, but the idea is that you were able to, or that it doesn't affect you as much because it is a lower percentage of your taxable income, whereas those who make less pay a higher percentage of their taxable income in sales tax. That is why it's considered regressive. It hits the low income or the middle income harder than it does for those who are well off, for those who make more money. What I want to discuss here is a theory, and I love theories because they, they tend not to be true. We have this thing called declining marginal propensity to consume. And declining marginal propensity to consume 
is a theory. People say it's a tendency. No, it's a theory that as income increases, a person's going to devote a smaller portion of their income to spending, and they're going to devote a larger portion to saving. So what this says is that the more money you make, the less you spend, the more you save. Is this true? No. Unfortunately not. There's a couple of years ago a study to see how much Americans, not Texans, Americans saved. You know the average saving rate that year was a negative 0.1%. As a country, we didn't save anything. So, realistically, the more money we make, the more we spend. We don't save it. Tax shifting. Do businesses pay taxes? Yes, they do. Well, do they really pay them? Or do they pass the cost of the taxes on to the consumer? While businesses do pay taxes, we see that these costs, these, these tax costs are shifted to, to the consumer in the form of higher prices. So we see tax shifting. The business is paying for it, and then they are getting reimbursed. They're getting their taxes paid back from the consumer because they are charging higher prices. Would this be a regressive type tax or would this be a progressive type, type of tax? This would be a regressive type tax because it is still, once again, going to affect those who make less money or those who have less disposable income because your prices are higher because of your taxes. The business's prices are higher because of the business taxes. Should we have a regressive or a progressive tax rate? Well, there's another theory, and this is called supply-side economics. And this is a theory that states we should have a regressive tax rate. And what this means, what this theory says, is that higher income taxpayers should be taxed less because it's their savings and their investments that stimulate the economy. So the more they're able to save, the more they're able to invest, the more jobs that will be created. Plus, not only that, sales and property taxes are easier to collect they're harder to evade or avoid, and they are generally less burdensome than progressive income taxes. But my question to you is, they're less burdensome for who? Are they less burdensome for the people that are making $150,000, $200,000 a year? Or are they less burdensome for the people that are making twenty-five dollars to $40,000 a year? Well, they're less burdensome to those who are well off, but there's more people in the twenty-five to forty thousand dollar a year range than that hundred and fifty thousand dollar a year range plus. There are some people who want to have a national sales tax and do away with progressive federal income tax. This way, everybody pays their fair share. Well, would this be a good idea? Well, once again, it's still going to be a regressive tax. If, is that correct? Because if everybody's still paying the same, it's still going to affect those who have less. We're paying more in taxes than those who have more. Now, taxes aren't the only places that our government finds money from. We do have non-tax revenues. <clears throat> we see that states will also get money from the federal government. These usually come in the form of grants. There's two types of grants here that I want to discuss, then I want to discuss a third thing. The first one is categorical grants. 
A categorical grant is federal aid to a state or a local government, but there's strings attached. There, there's three things this grant is to be used for specific purposes, under restrictive conditions, and they often require some sort of matching funds from the receiving level of government. And what I mean by this is we might see the city of Houston or the state of Texas say we're going the federal government we're going to give you 20 million dollars if you work on this let me let me start over we're going to give you 20 million dollars towards transportation however to receive this 20 million dollars you must kick in $2 million of your own. This is the matching fund. Matching doesn't have to be dollar for dollar, it can be just a percent. So we'll give you $20 million if you kick in $2 million and you use these funds to widen, pick a portion of a highway, I don't care which one, but we're going to dictate to you what and how or how you use this money. These are the restrictive conditions or the specific purposes. You have to kick in funds. You have to use it to widen Interstate 10 and you have to widen it from five lanes to eight lanes. This would be an example of a categorical grant. Well, states don't like this. This is often a, a one-size-fits-all approach. The problem here, here is how do we know, or how does the national government know what is the best approach? How does it know our priorities, what we need to fix? It doesn't. What we saw under start, that started under President Nixon and it continued under President Reagan was the use of block grants. Block grants were a mean to return control to the states. Block grants are simply here is 20 million dollars to use for construction. You know, the federal government saying Texas, here is 20 million dollars to use for to use for transportation use it as you wish. You know your your priorities. States love block grants because we're not tied in. State government, local government can use it at where they think the biggest need is. However, federal government hates block grants because they lose control. They cannot guarantee that the money is being used as was intended. Now there's another term here called devolution. And devolution is an attempt to enhance the power of the state or local government. What I mean by this is the federal government says, hey, we have the authority to do this. However, state you know, you know your areas, you know your needs better than we do. So while we have this authority, we're going to devolve it. We're going to, to pass the responsibility down a level and let you take care of your own problems, let you take care of your own business. Devolution could be the state government saying the same thing to the local government. We understand. We have the authority to do this. However, you are better equipped to do this. You understand your needs. You understand the best way to implement this. So if this is the, the definition of devolution, which one of these grants is actually an example of devolution? Is it categorical grant or block grant? The block grant is an example of devolution. It's the federal government saying, yes, we have this authority. Yes, we can do this. However, you know, by giving you this money, 
we are letting our authority go. We are delegating the responsibility to you. So block grants would be an example of devolution. We tax, we get money from the government, but there are often times that that's still not enough money. So we have to look at other places. Some of the things that the local governments will look at, the first one is general obligation bonds. And these are general use bonds are going to be used to improve the city, improve streets, whatever. General obligation bonds are bonds that are to be repaid from general taxes or other revenues. These general obligation bonds usually must be approved by the voter. Well, then we have something else called revenue bonds. And revenue bonds are bonds that are to be repaid with revenues from the projects that they will finance. These projects can be utilities, hotels, sports stadiums. What the revenue bond is is that these bonds are sold or this money is taken out and a percent of the income that is generated by this new venue, by these hotels, by these utilities, by these sports stadiums. A percent of this income is used to pay off the debt. So general obligation bonds, they're repaid from general taxes. Revenue bonds are going to be repaid from the item that they built. We see other revenues out there that the state uses, and these other revenues in Texas, they can be lottery, you know, revenue from the lottery, various licenses, there's fines, there's fees, there's dividends from investments, the sale and leasing of public lands. So there's other sources of revenue that Texas also uses. These are smaller, they're not great, we don't count on them very much, but they do exist. We're almost done, guys. The budgetary process. The budgetary process, there's two ways we can look at this. The first thing we look at, or the first way, is incremental budgeting. And incremental budgeting is simply a method where we are basing an agency's budget request on past appropriations, plus increases to cover inflation and increased demand for their services. So what we're going to look at is how much money did we give them last year? Did they do a good job? Do we, do we need to increase their service? Do we need to increase their appropriations so that they can serve more people? And did the cost of living go up? Did inflation occur? That's incremental budgeting. Might be, okay, your budget's $10 million. We expect you to serve 20% more people. So we're going to give you an additional $2 million to raise your budget to $12 million and th inflation was 3%. So we're gonna, we're gonna raise your budget at an additional 3% to cover the cost of inflation. That would be incremental budgeting. What's wrong with this type of budgeting? This budgeting doesn't, this type of budgeting doesn't encourage the wisest use of money. And what I mean by this is if you get to the end of your budget cycle and you have money left, do you want more money or do you want less money if you're an agency? Remember, more money, more power. So you want to use up every dollar you possibly can. So you might get to the end of your budget cycle and say, oh, I have $200,000 left. What can we purchase? Not what do we need, but what can we purchase to use all of this money to show we spent it all. 
Can we purchase new computers? Can we purchase new office furniture? We don't necessarily need it, but we can tell the Texas legislature, oh look, we used all of our money. We used our complete budget for this year. We need more money for next year. That's the problem with incremental budgeting. The other option is something that's called zero-based budgeting. And this is simply a method where a budget request is evaluated as if the program was a new program. We do not consider past levels of funding. We don't take that into account. It's this is what we want you to do. How much do we think, how much money do you, we think you need to successfully accomplish this? I don't care what we paid you last year. That's not coming into the equation. That zero-based budgeting. You heard me using the term appropriations. This is just a reminder that appropriations is simply the process by which a legislative body legally authorizes a government to spend specific sums of money to provide various programs or services. That's appropriations, the government spending money. The politics of state spending, there's two things here. First is, how do we get these bills passed? If I want something passed in my district and it only benefits my district, is there any reason that any other Texas legislator, whether it be a House member or a Texas senator, should vote to help me benefit my district? Well, the answer is no. If, if it passes, great. If it doesn't pass, it doesn't hurt them at all. So we go into something called log rolling. And log rolling is simply a trading of votes among legislators. And we see this when there's going to be a vote to fund local projects to benefit certain districts. What I mean by this, if you're benefiting what area, I pick an area, I don't care. If you're going to benefit, you want a project to benefit the Bryan College Station area. Does somebody who represents El Paso have any reason to support you? No, they don't. It's not going to affect them in any way, shape, or form. So what you do, if, if you're the representative for the Bryan College Station area, is you go up to this representative from El Paso and say, if you support me in this, at a later date, when you want something and you need my vote, I will return the favor. I will vote in favor of what you want. So log rolling, it's politics. Last thing I want to talk about, and we'll go into greater detail in our next chapter about this, is something called dedicated funds. And dedicated funds are simply revenues that are dedicated for a specific purpose by the Constitution or by statute or by you know, state law. An example of this, I'm going to go back to this gas tax. There has to be a certain amount of gas tax, this gas tax, a certain amount has to go to a certain agency. It has to go to tech stop. I will go into greater detail about that in our next lecture. Have a good day, guys.